Hello, everyone. I am here with Dr. Harvey J. K. He is a professor of democracy and justice at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And he is also the author of a fantastic book called Take Hold of Our History, Make America Radical Again. And he's here to talk about it. I just finished the book on Monday and it's phenomenal. So, Professor, thank you so much for coming on the program. No, th thank you for having me on. This, this is great. It's a great opportunity. And, and also, I've been really eager to, to meet you because I've watched some of your stuff and I, I like your spirit. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much. You know, I, I found out about you from the Michael Brooks show. Shout out to Michael Brooks. He always brings on these fantastic guests. And that's where I saw your book and I bought the book. And it was so great because it kind of reaffirms everything that I've been thinking, because there's this conversation in mainstream media currently about whether or not people in the Democratic Party, namely AOC, Rashida Tlaib, are going too far left. And basically what you demonstrate in this book is that people who say that social Democrats are too far left, they're kind of ahistorical because we have a history of being radical. FTR called on a generation to be radical or on people to be radical for a generation. So can you talk about our history as basically radicals? Because I think that people here in mainstream media that you can't be too far left in America because we are a conservative country. And sure, people identify as conservative, but political labels don't necessarily mean that much. Because when you look at the policies, we are very progressive. And now when you look at our history, there's no question. We're a radical nation. So can you talk through our history and how we are actually radical? And I know that that's a really huge you know, topic, but can you give us the rundown? Well, okay. So the high points, how's that? There so you go. the high points begin with my childhood hero, Thomas Paine, and in his pamphlet, Common Sense, which was a pamphlet in which he put into words what Americans were already thinking in the course of their rebellion of 19, I'm sorry, of 1774 and 1775. But they hadn't themselves gotten to the point of seeing the possibility of not only declaring their independence and creating this new radical nation, but also of creating a democratic republic. And it was Paine who basically brought, brought forth their sentiments and their ideas that they had yet to articulate. And Paine says something in that in that pamphlet, Common Sense of January 76, which I think it's in one sense, it seems so utopian. And in another sense, it's so absolutely true. He says we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Now, it's utopian because, of course, we can't just, you know, stop history and start all over again. But it's but it's true in the sense that what he's saying is history is made by human action. And therefore, we have a possibility of truly radically transforming our relationship to the world. And he was trying to get Americans to realize that they were, in fact, Americans, not Britons. They should, that, and thus, they should not think of themselves as British subjects and what might they accomplish in those terms, but think of themselves as American citizens. And he also asked them to consider, it's like the, the, what they used to say during the late 60s, the whole world is watching. The humanity was waiting for that kind of revolutionary moment that Americans themselves were able to, to, to create and provide for all, of, for all of the Americans' faults and failings at the time. And all of that comes to be in some ways expressed in the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable, you know, unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, those words, now to, to move ahead in radical terms and social democratic terms, those words actually did provide the basis for in every generation, both Paine's words and you know Jefferson's own, you might say, provided so that in every generation of, of American history, the most progressive elements, whether they were liberals or progressives or radicals or indeed eventually socialists, when they reached back to lay claim to the American Revolution, they laid hold of common sense and the Declaration to say, look, we are what America is about. America is a grand experiment in democracy. And basically, look, let's face it, any experiment requires constant testing and pushing at the limits. So, you know, whether they were free thinkers or abolitionists or women's rights activists, also known as suffragists eventually, or whether they were labor unionists, uh, populists of the late 19th century, progressives with a capital P, socialists, anarchists, in every one of those generations, they reached all the way through to the civil rights movement and even to today, this kind of they, this reaching back took place and this reminding of themselves of what America is meant to be. Again, 
we have a history of exploitation and oppression and, and enough tragedy and irony that we could go on forever on that subject. But it's also the case that through the course of those confrontations and those struggles and those aspirations that created movements, we actually did create a far freer, more equal and more democratic America. And then if I could take it in another direction, which people often find surprising, is that if we actually think about social democracy itself, it's rooted in the same pen, and I say pen, that actually sparks the, or turns the American rebellion into a revolution. Because 20 years later, in the 1790s, Thomas Paine writes Rights of Man in the midst of the French Revolution. And then he writes a pamphlet called Agrarian Justice, which is, which is the pamphlet that first envisioned social democracy. In this pamphlet, he called for taxing the landed rich in order to provide stakes, S-T-A-K-E-S, to young people so that you could combat poverty, okay? At the, that when they reach maturity, they should be given a certain amount of money in order to go out and make something of themselves in the world and prevent poverty from becoming the norm of their lives. But it also included this very radical idea, which later co we come to call social security. He actually said there should be universal old age pensions for, for, for men and women when they reach a certain age of, you know, we'll call the L, an, a, a seniority age. So, so here is Thomas Paine, the American revolutionary and, and radical founder, who's also 20 years later seeing the consequences in Europe, especially of what we would call capitalism, he would call civilization. And he said, it's imperative that we recognize that the earth was created for all of us and property has been monopolized by a lot of people. He didn't call for dispossessing the property, but he said, they owe all of us a tax to provide for the makings of what we think of as social democracy. And then if you, if you move through history, and I could go on and on, but let's go right to one of the greatest names in American history, Abraham Lincoln. Even as Lincoln led the Union in the Civil War to sustain the Union and, in, and truly when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation in response to all of those Southern slaves seeking uh, freedom in the North and seeking a role in the, in the Civil War against slavery, Lincoln also signed two other very significant bills, one of which is the Homestead Act, which was the transformation of the Midwest and the Plain States into family farming, okay, affording federal, federal lands to family farms. That's social democracy at its best in many ways, enabling people to make, to make their way, with, uh, to secure a wherewithal for themselves. But then he also signed another social democratic bill, the Marill Act which was the Land Grant Act, which provided federal lands to states to create state colleges and universities. So that now in every state of the union, there are state universities and state university systems, which are rooted in the 1862 Marill Act that Lincoln signed. So here we have the, the, the greatest president of the 19th century, some people the greatest president ever, who is known, of course, as the great emancipator, though he himself fully appreciated that there was no way that he could sign the, the Emancipation Proclamation had it not been for slaves rising up in the South and Northern farmers and workers in the Union Army realizing the imperative of ending slavery. Here he is advancing the, the idea of equality to include social democracy. And then, of course, the great social democratic president, though he never used the term, is Franklin Roosevelt. And, you know, it's the New Deal, it's the, it's the creation of Social Security, it's the en en enactment of the National Labor Relations Act. I mean, over and over again, our greatest moments in American history are moments of radicalism and social democratic advance. And I love the way that you talk about that in the book, because the way that you frame it is there's there's no end point to democracy. This is an ongoing project where we're constantly trying to push the envelope and radicalism is in our DNA as Americans. So to suggest, you know, a, as we often see in the mainstream media, that actually, you know, we're, we're more conservative ideologically, we're not radical, we can't be too far left. That is a historical, and I, I love the way that you lay this out. Now, one narrative that I think is really interesting, just in general with regard to American politics, is there, there's always like, a conservative will say something, right? And then all of a sudden you see a hundred conservatives parroting that same thing in mainstream media and that narrative catches on and it has led to the left essentially losing any type of battle, political battle, ideological battle in a way because they're so good 
at, you know, re retaking back whatever narrative or reframing a narrative. And I think it's because you kind of diagnosed this problem. And I want to see if I could find that line. Um, so this is what you say. Democratic presidents Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama offer no real challenge to the right wing storytelling. They are so good at storytelling. They are able to take whatever we're talking about and flip it and have that catch on. I mean, one example that stands out to me is when we were discussing the Affordable Care Act, which was right-wing healthcare reform. It was milk toast. It was cooked up by the Heritage Foundation. We were talking about death panels all of a sudden, and the mainstream media had to, you know, assume that that was an idea that was credible or at least, you know, respond to it. So can you talk a little bit about storytelling and why that's so important? Because I kind of see you doing storytelling in the sense that you're telling us about our actual history and not allowing them to capture that narrative and not let go of it. Yeah, well, there's a moment I can, there's a, a moment, I think, that's really very telling in those terms. And it's in the late 1970s when Ronald Reagan, well, in 76, he lost the Republican nomination to Gerald Ford. And I think a lot of people figured Reagan was out of the picture. But he makes a comeback comeback. And he was far smarter than most people on the left appreciated. And literally the connections he was making in the course of the 60s and 70s as the leader of the of what we come to know as the new right enabled him to win the nomination from the Republicans in 1980. But here's the key thing. So winning the Republican nomination was by no means a guarantee he would have won the presidency, though the chances were good given the fact that Jimmy Carter was such an abysmal president and most Americans were utterly working people, utterly fed up with his presidency. But here's the thing. He knew from his own early days as a liberal Democrat, an FDR and a Truman Democrat, that most working people were not going to respond to the kinds of things that he was known for having promoted back in the 60s into the 70s, like an attack on Social Security, you know, or, or for that matter, ending farm subsidies. I mean, you, the panoply, the whole thing that FDR had put into place in the New Deal. So he completely shifts his ground in many ways and drops the sort of attacks on, on, um, on the New Deal legacy. He continues to sort of campaign against liberalism, undeniably. But in his acceptance speech, which is, of course, going to be watched by the vast majority of Americans back in those days, conventions mattered even more than they do today. And people watched them to see what the political uh, atmosphere of the day would become. And he stands before the Republican convention and shocks the hell out of conservatives, even as he's literally becoming their not just champion, but their their standard holder, their, you know, their flag bearer. He quotes in the course of his acceptance speech three figures left should have had an option. Thomas Paine, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt. He's so shocked conservatives that George Will, I believe, wrote a column almost immediately after the convention lamenting the fact that, that Reagan had quoted Thomas Paine, the, the, the revolutionary, as opposed to Burke, Edmund Burke, the conservative. Yeah, so they're really good conservatives in terms of, first of all, asking questions about American history, and then suppressing the story that, that most Americans carry with them, but appropriating, ripping off, hijacking figures and events from the past and inserting them into an utterly alien narrative that they would, I mean, who could have imagined Thomas Paine ever being quoted by a conservative? For 200 years, conservatives did everything to suppress Thomas Paine's memory. Who could have imagined the Republicans any time after, say, 1932, really wanting to embrace Lincoln? Because here's Lincoln, you know, the man who brings an end to slavery, who, who becomes the social democrat. Well, here's the thing. What, has hap what happens is that in the course of the 70s, the Democrats retreated. They retreated from the Roosevelt story and legacy. Uh, figures like uh, Gary Hart. I don't know if everyone will remember Gary Hart, but Gary Hart, the uh, senator from Oregon, well, becomes senator from Oregon, and Jimmy Carter. These kind of figures, they turn their backs on not just the FDR legacy and the FDR tradition, they turn their backs on American working people. Seriously turn their backs on American working people. Moreover, there was this, they sought out the money power, as the populists might have called them. The money power, that is, they were, they wanted to fill their coffers with the money of the rich and the corporate uh, uh, entities, instead of thinking about mobilizing Americans. And in fact, they felt no need to speak 
of the American story, the American story that would have been Thomas Paine, Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, but rather they sort of retreated. And what happens is, whether it was liberals inside the Democratic Party or leftists outside of it, if you look over and over again, the story that they're responding to of the conservatives leads them in a knee-jerk way to reject the American story. In other words, the left literally turned its back on its own story and its own powerful claim to America, to the United States. Now, we should never turn our back and forever forget the stories of exploitation and oppression. I mean, I mean, the struggles emerge out of those experiences. But it's also the case, if we're not going to remember the, if the, the American promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which Lincoln readily used to advance his cause, which FDR readily used, if we're going to forget those things, then we're basically handing over American history full time to the conservatives. Now, it, it's all the more imperative that we not continue to do that because Americans themselves yearn for that story. They, they, they feel it in them. You called it the American DNA. We feel it in a deep cultural memory-like way. And the fact is the Democrats and the left failed to articulate the story that Americans were yearning to hear and that conservatives appropriated or hijacked and ultimately corrupted in terrible ways. And in fact, one of the beauties to go, you know, you mentioned, um, I can't remember if it was during our conversation or beforehand, you know, the, the, the squad, you know, AOC and, and her comrades. One of the things that really struck me is very early on after she won election to, uh, the, to Congress, AOC was interviewed, I think it was the, on TV by one of the, you know, the, the sort of mainstream media types. And she actually laid claim to the American story, you know, of Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt. And, but the surprising thing was that there were people on the left who said, what is she doing? You know, why is she doing that? And I thought, are they kidding? I mean, she's out ahead of a whole couple of generations of left intellectuals by laying claim to that. And Bernie Sanders, even more than he had done in 2015, which he did smartly on one occasion, but then failed to continue. This time around, he is laying claim to that Roosevelt legacy. So, I mean, I think there's reason to be hopeful. But here's the thing. It isn't only that we do that in order to win an election. I mean, there's no guarantees of winning elections. But we need to cultivate the narrative that conservatives for 45 years have over and over again tried to you know, pervert and corrupt and tell it as a sort of God, God-given divine story, America, as opposed to a story of struggles from the bottom up. And so, so in essence, what we need to do is we have to break through the kind of nostalgia renditions of American history and remind Americans of who they are, and they want to be reminded. That's the thing. I mean, I, there are surveys and polls that show that. Two good examples. The whole phenomenon that was called founders chic or founders fever back in the 70s, when all of a sudden everybody was talking about the founding fathers, okay? Similarly, the greatest generation phenomena. Everybody was celebrating the World War II generation. The conservatives immediately glommed on to those two things as if those are conservative stories. And everyone thought because the vast majority of Americans seemed interested in hearing those stories that they were doing so because they were somehow fooled by the conservatives or that they themselves were conservative. What the left, and, and by the way, the left scorned a lot of that talk. And what they utterly failed to do is to lay claim to Thomas Paine or reclaim Thomas Paine, or for that matter, to realize the greatest generation is the generation that actually made the New Deal happen. The generation that pushed FDR to go even further towards social democracy than he himself might have gone. So it, it, it was astounding to me and frustrating as hell that when I would speak sometimes of these things, people on the left would get angry with me. You know, like I was like I was some kind of nationalist, a patriot. Yes, a nationalist. That's another story. OK, and I think we we need to reclaim the American story, not simply for the sake of remembering them, but for the sake of remembering who we are.
Yeah, and that that reminds me of what you talked about, basically us taking back that narrative of American exceptionalism, because now it has very negative connotations if you're a lefty. You know, we think about, um, I think about U.S. imperialism, U.S. supremacy, but really that wasn't necessarily always the case. It was another narrative and story, if you will, that conservatives had reclaimed. So you, you talked about, you know, 45 years of the Republican Party doing deregulation, austerity. Um, you know, shifting the tax burden from the working class um, or away from elites to the working class. And now I think that there is reason to be optimistic when we know about the history and basically know what to look for. Like you mentioned, Occupy popping up, you know, the, the success of Bernie in 2015 and now, you know, 2019. And even though necessarily electoral politics in and of itself might not be what catalyzes the shift, you know, to greater democratization. Um, you know, it, it always comes from the bottom up. And I think that, that this book is a reminder that real change does come from the bottom up when we are reminded that we have always pushed further. You know, we've always pushed the envelope. And real change never comes from the top down. It's always the bottom up. Now, one portion of this book, and we talked about this before going on, um, that really stood out to me that I loved because it irritated me was uh, back in 2015, <laughs> we were talking about social democracy finally and Claire McCaskill was interviewed on MSNBC and she kind of scoffed at this idea of Bernie Sanders being the nominee and she said, oh, he's too liberal. Now I love a line, like your response in this basically was, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, um, well, we know that Republicans lost their mind, so now we, we have to worry about Democrats losing their mind too. And you made a point that social democracy is... American. This is not a foreign concept. We're not talking about European democracy. We're talking about American, uh, an American concept. Social democracy is American. Can you kind of speak a little bit to that? Because I think it's something that's really fascinating. And I, I think that even myself, like I, I, I think I do a disservice because when I talk about social democracy, I use Scandinavia as an example. I always point there. I point elsewhere as basically, you know, legitimizing my argument using empirical data. But we don't even have to do that because social democracy is American. Can you speak to that? Well, as I said before, so Thomas Paine is the godfather of social security and social democracy, okay? This American revolutionary, that's first of all. Abraham Lincoln is in many ways the first of the sort of proto, call it social democratic or proto-social democratic presidents. Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal, the, or the, the, the empowerment of labor. But here's the other thing. Let, let's go to something very, very basically American which has been under siege these last 45 years, especially under siege from the right, public education. The first nation to truly create public education as a right for young people, okay? It's not in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, but it is in state constitutions. And we accept it as a fundamental right, the right to be educated. Well, public education is the great social democratic beginning where you're saying we're all in this together, we need an educated citizenry, a concept that goes back to even the elite of the founding fathers who, who believe that in order to sustain a republic, you needed an, ed an educated, informed citizenry. So we, we pioneer public education, right? Even the, uh, and then if, if you think about it, think about it this way, when the whole idea of a national park system, not a royal park system, as in European uh, nations, but national parks. National parks were this late 19th century American development. They have actually originate as a concept in the Lincoln, Lincoln president, expand in the progressive era, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, but even beyond that, Franklin Roosevelt's attention to all of that. The national park system is this great social democratic idea that we can all have access for recreation and refreshment of ourselves, and that we don't have to pay for it, okay? I mean, that's social democracy. Similarly, you know, social security and so on. Two, two things I want to point out in those terms. One, I'll jump ahead. Michael Moore did a film a few years ago, uh, Where to Invade Next, something like that. Does that, you, you remember that film? It, yeah, it, and, it, it wasn't what I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> no, it's like, you know, it's the idea is he goes to Europe and he checks out all of their social democratic innovations. But w the point of the film wasn't, Scandinavia or the continent of Europe, the point was that these were all American innovations that the Europeans adopted and that somehow we've forgotten or we failed to advance because we've been under siege in a, this class war from above that Republicans have championed these last 40, 45 years. So, okay, so here's the, here's another, here's the other thought. 
So Bernie Sanders, as I said before, in 2015, he, he actually gave a speech at Georgetown University to explain democratic socialism, which is just another term for social democracy, basically. And, and, I, and in that speech, he, what he does is he recalls Franklin Roosevelt's idea of the Economic Bill of Rights. Uh, Roosevelt himself in 32 proposed an economic declaration of rights. In 1941, he actually called for Americans to envision and pursue Four Freedoms. I did a book on the fight for the Four Freedoms. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And then in 1944, in a State of the Union message, FDR calls for the creation and enactment of an economic bill of rights, which is, believe me, a, the radical presentation of social democracy. So it never comes to fruition as he envisioned, but it is it is developed in terms of what was called the GI Bill of Rights, that in, and in which a whole generation of veterans, 12 million of them, literally make something of themselves with the educational and other kinds of opportunities that the GI Bill of Rights afforded, and they remake the nation, they rebuild the nation. And everybody today with any kind of historical sensibility knows of the GI Bill of Rights, but what we, what we fail to do and what the Democrats have failed to do is to say, we have this story of this great, these great social democratic innovations. So what I would imagine is, as Bernie has begun to do more effectively, is that the Democrats, if you're not a social democrat, you can't be a democrat. Claire McCaskill had the audacity to say that, well, in 2015, we have these extremists, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And I thought to myself, how dare she? How dare she? She was, she, it's like she was a Republican, not a Democrat, right? How dare she utterly reject the greatest moments of the Democrats, capital D and small d Democratic story, the struggles of the New Deal years, which were both top down and bottom up, the, the advancements that even took place during World War II, and then think about the 1960s. I mean, for all, you know, he was a Southern Democrat, LBJ, but he was an old FDR Democrat, and Medicare, Medicaid, um, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, of course, the Environmental Protection uh, Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, consumer rights, all of these developments of the 60s, which were, if you like, the, the advancement of the social democratic ideal that FDR had truly put on the agenda. And this pseudo-democrat, Claire McCaskill, says, Bernie's an extremist. And that's when I said, yeah, the Democrats must be losing their minds. They clearly lost their memories, their amnesiacs. But our task must be to make sure not just that we you know talk about social democracy but that we remind americans that social democracy as you said or as the, I, as bill moyers who really was the source of the idea for my writing that said social democracy is 100 percent american bill and i were supposed to co-author that piece but something came up and i ended up doing it and he wouldn't put his name on it because he said you wrote it you take the credit and i can tell you that piece is probably the most liked piece I've ever written in the sense on Twitter and on Facebook. It, the response was tremendous. So I was convinced Americans wanted to hear the truth of history, not the kind of crap that the Republicans were spewing, and surely not the kind of crap that Claire McCaskill was spewing. <laughs> yeah, I love that you brought that up in the book, because that clip, there was something about it, like the way that she said it, too. It just it irked me and it really stuck, you know, it stuck by me. Um, and it's been on my mind. And when I read that in the book, I just thought, oh, this is this is so good. So the book itself, to me, like this is a reminder that we are on the right path. And I don't know that we're going to get there in this generation, but we certainly are doing the right thing. And I think that there's this you can correct me if um, if I'm wrong. I think that there's this instinct on the left for us to kind of self censor because Republicans are so good at storytelling and capturing that narrative. You know, we don't want to go too far left because that could turn off voters. But in actuality, we're just basically returning to our roots. And I think that that is incredibly important. So my pitch for the book is everyone who is a believer in, you know, uh, Bernie's presidency um, and campaign and social democracy has got to read this because it, it basically it tells you that you're on the right track. But before we go, I want to allow you to make your pitch for the book. It's fun. It's phenomenal. We'll have links on screen and down below for people to order it. Uh, but tell us what you think that we haven't discussed. People need to know about the book. Well, OK, I, I want to give credit to the people who've inspired me to think in those terms. OK, so 
we need to remember that we're the like the children of Thomas Paine, the revolutionary. Okay, we carry it with us. He made us radicals then, and we're we're radicals to this day. And I wrote an earlier book, Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. But this book, okay, so that was one. Then I wrote this book titled The Fight for the Four Freedoms about FDR and the Greatest Generation. Man, those books are highly political as much as they're historical. But this book, if I can then hold it up again myself, this take hold of our history, make America radical again. This this book is says that this. It's not just a matter of making sense of why we feel the way we do why we why it is that we saw these movements emerge like the fight for 15 black lives matter the 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 um eventually the march the the women's march uh the moral monday movement the teachers strikes i mean those are remar- all of these things indicate that we are we yearn to in langston hughes great poetic uh terms we want to make america america the America that has never been. But that's the story of progressivism and radicalism and democratic socialism, that we are seeking to make America the America that is that is part of our promise, but as yet has never been. Now, I just, I'd like to, there's a quote that I love using. I probably use it in all my writing. Uh, it was Henry Demers Lloyd, a, a journalist of around 1900, who was a, depending on who claims him, either a populist or progressive or a socialist, doesn't matter. He said, basically, and he drew on Wendell Phillips, the 19th century radical, when he said this. He said, you know, liberty requires more than perpetual vigilance. If we're going to sustain liberty or democracy and freedom and equality, we not only have to defend and protect the rights that our parents gave us, we need to create new rights for our children. And that's the point. There's a radical imperative in American life. We feel it. We don't always act upon it. But what that imperative is trying to tell us is if you believe in democracy, then you don't simply defend democracy. To sustain democracy, you have to extend and deepen it. I can't make that point strongly enough. And the best evidence of that is that when Americans have been in the face of mortal crises, the 1770s, the 1860s, the 1930s, the 1940s, maybe even the 1960s in the Cold War, what we've found is that the only way, whether we liked it or not, in fact, the only way to confront and transcend the crisis and our enemies, whether they were foreign or domestic, was to make America radical, democratic public, and slavery empower working people and, and, you know, civil rights and voting rights and, and, and enabling people to transcend the poverty of their lives. That's what America is meant to be. And that's that's the struggle ahead of us. So I'll go back to something you said. It's not a matter of going too far left. It's how American do we want to be? I love that. And um, we can't possibly end stronger than that. It's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Professor K. Once again, the book is Take Hold of Our History, Make America Radical. Again, there will be links in the description box if you'd like to read it yourself. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure talking with you.